Hello and welcome to this video and this video is going to be called 10 reasons why Eddie Van Halen is the genius of rock. Right so I'm going to be doing a lot on this video there's going to be a I'm going to rank the Van Halen albums um, but only some of them as I will explain later and I'm going to go through 10 reasons why Eddie Van Halen is the true genius of rock music. Every art form has its geniuses. If we take YouTube, for example, music YouTubers, I'm just a lowly, small little planet in the universe of music YouTubes. Of course, the Mozart of YouTube, music YouTubers is Mr. Rick Beato, of course. And in classical music, the Mozart of classical music is Mozart. In rock music, the true genius of rock music is probably Frank Zappa, but also Eddie Van Halen. Now, Eddie Van Halen was born in Holland, um, along with his brother, Alex Van Halen. They were both born in Holland, uh, which is probably because they were brothers. And uh, <laughs> oh, this is starting off a bit strange. And um, their dad was Dutch, he was a musician. His dad was Dutch because he was from Holland. It's sort of all making sense now, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> so, um, He's born in Holland, his dad's Dutch, he's a professional musician, he's playing a lot of, so I think, traditional jazz, marching music, all that sort of stuff. Uh, his mom is Philippine, um, or Filipino, I think is the actual proper term, or maybe not, but I've said both now. So, uh, so um, when he's a, a youngster, his dad books them on a ticket to America. He pays with it by playing in the band. They arrive in America under very poor circumstances, the dad's having to do all sorts of work and also work the weekends as a professional musician. He brings his kids up as musicians and Alex and Eddie both start with piano lessons. It's quite obvious that uh, both of them extremely musically talented, but Eddie ever so. Um, these piano competitions that he's put in for, um, there's something like thousands of entrants to these compositions and more than once Eddie won, okay? Which is more incredible when you know that these classical compositions he was playing, he was learning by ear. His uh, uh, piano teacher thought he could read music, his ear was so good. And it wasn't until he'd had lessons, say five or six years, that the uh, piano teacher suddenly discovered that Eddie couldn't read music, okay? This is testament to Eddie Van Halen's extreme musical talent but also his commitment to go his own route and to use his own ears and his own mind to explore new territories. Now, as um, he gets into his teenage years, well, not only his teenage years, his early teenage years, there's this explosion of rock music around him and his big hero becomes Eric Clapton. And uh, Eric Clapton is, um, doesn't get the credit but I would say there's a big line from, from Eric Clapton to Eddie Van Halen and then to Steve Vai and all the guitarists we have nowadays, Nuno Betancourt. There's a straight line that runs straight from Eric Clapton. When he was asked about Jimi Hendrix, he, he wasn't so influenced by Jimi Hendrix. This is really interesting. Now he would say, where's the influence coming from? Well, one of the things with Eddie Van Halen is the great innovations he did on guitar, he did with these, with his fingers. Um, it's on the whole it's a guitar plugged straight into an amp very much like Eric Clapton he wasn't one for doing lots of different guitar tones and lots of effects like a Jimmy Page although I'm sure Jimmy Page was an influence as well um, but Eddie Van Halen probably out of circumstance and not being able to afford all the gear had to try and get the sounds out of his head with what he had at hand and this meant learning how the guitar works, learning how amplifiers work. Um, he forms a band with his brother. Um, he's originally a drummer. Alex is the guitarist, but he has a natural uh, penchant for the guitar. Alex has a natural penchant for the drums. Alex Van Halen goes on to be one of the most influential drummers um, in rock history. When I was coming up and I was listening to all sorts of different rock drummers, in the early days, uh, Alex Van Halen for me was a major influence. 
such a creative and innovative drummer with an incredible groove and an incredible sound. And I think he doesn't get the credit. Um, so he forms a band with his brother. He brings in Dave Lee Roth. Now, Dave Lee Roth is, again, a one-off, all right? This is a guy that has all the looks and, and uh, charisma of a Robert Plant. He's a proper rock front, rock, you know, rock band front person. Um, but he, his roots go back to vaudeville. He's a big fan of Al Jolson. And that sort of vaudeville influence starts to creep in. Um, Dave Lee Roth is a popularist. He wants to entertain the audience. Eddie Van Halen's a musical genius. When you get those two together, it's like a perfect balance. And I must mention Michael Anthony, um, who doesn't get any credit at all in this. Uh, he's a sort of often just sideswept away. But I've always, always thought that every great band needs its anchor. It's usually the bass player. Um, and he provides an incredible anchor in this band. Um, some of the stuff is difficult to play. There's a lot of weird timings and all sorts of stuff going on. And Michael Anthony, Anthony handles it um, with a plum. Um, but the other thing I want to mention is with Dave Lee Roth up front, and I think Dave Lee Roth is the greatest frontman of all time. Sorry, uh, Freddie Mercury, but I think he just its edges over um, Freddie Mercury. Anyone who can do the splits off a drum riser, <laughs> I think needs to get the, uh, the number one place for that. Um, behind them, Eddie and especially Michael Anthony have these sorts of almost like Beach Boy vocals coming at you, right? So this band forms, they're, they're making their way in their local area and they're having to play cover versions. Um, it's guitar, bass and drums. I think Ed, Eddie Van Halen, the reason why his style came out is because he was trying to play all these different songs and put everything onto the guitar and also he wanted to rock because his heroes were Led Zeppelin and Clapton and Cream and all these bands. So he wanted to have that sound as well. And so it all comes together. Um, they earn their dues. They become a band that can entertain, that can go out in front. And so we have this magical mixture of extreme musical virtuosity, which is highly innovative, but also a band that is massively entertaining at the same time. Um, through a whole host of people, uh, we need to give credit to Gene Simmons here, because Gene Simmons didn't discover the band, um, but um, I think it was a, a local DJ or something just, you know, heard the band, and so Gene Simmons came in, he paid for them to do a demo that didn't really do the work, but he got me in certain places, and eventually Ted Templeman, who became their producer, who was looking for a new guitar-based band, signed them and they went in and recorded their first album, which is uh, Just Over My Shoulder. Um, this album completely changes rock music. And we have to ask ourselves a question, which I will answer later in this video, as to why this album hasn't gone down in history in the same way as Never Mind the Bollocks by the Sex Pistols or um, Led Zet One or um, Jimi Hendrix, Are You Experienced? All these albums that will always come up. This one just does not get the credit, and yet there is probably no single album that changed the course of rock music as much as this one did. It's absolutely groundbreaking. Um, they sign just after the big punk thing. It's quite interesting that they got their deal um, from a gig they did um, with, alongside a, a punk band. I wish I could remember the name of the punk band, but uh, they came into the punk scene. They are totally not punk, but they have the energy of punk. What's gonna happen to heavy metal um, in the 1980s is he's gonna take that sort of classic heavy rock sound of Zeppelin and Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, but it's gonna cut the energy of punk in. And so many bands get um, a credit for doing that. Motorhead would be one, Judas Priest. Um, but Van Halen, more than any other, are doing that as well. So the influence is absolutely huge and I haven't even begun begin to touch on it. Now, I think part of the reason why um, they don't get their due is because a lot of the innovations they made were musical ones. And this is at a time when punk was the big thing. And the music critics wanted to champion punk because they could write about it. But musical innovations they're blind to this. They don't understand. But the musicians that are coming up, I am one of these musicians that in the early 80s, being into rock music, 
got a Van Halen album and my jaw hit the floor. Any musician at that time, you know, even jazz musicians, the whole lot, hearing what Eddie Van Halen was doing on guitar was like a revelation. You know, people just did not know what the hell was going on. That's the truth. But it was packaged in the coolest, rockiest rock band of all time. Um, if you've guessed it, I absolutely love Van Halen, right? Now, these musical um, influences, right? Taking his guitar style aside, which is jaw-dropping and everyone's spoken about it, let's get uh, um, 10 solid um, innovations that change the course of music, okay? Now, I've got them listed here. Now, the first one, number one, is guitar tab, okay? Now, guitar tab is a way of writing down guitar. It gives you um, the fret positions, uh, and it gives you ways of attacking the notes and putting certain articulation in. Now, guitar tab did not exist in the 1970s. Musicians who were coming up through a rock thing, I was one of these musicians, we never learned to read. Um, we learned to read words. Well, some rock musicians did, but we didn't learn to read music. I can read drum music now, pretty okay, not brilliant at it, um, but I am an ear player, I'm a rock musician, right? I didn't come through that schooled route, and that's what rock musicians did. Um, so if in the early 70s you wanted to learn Jimmy Page guitar solo, you had to use these, and that was it. Guitar came out because there was no way of writing Eddie Van Halen's guitar playing down because what he was doing was so based upon an articulation that you would not understand it. When you listen to Eruption and he starts tapping all over the guitar, and believe me, Eddie Van Halen's innovation on guitar is not tapping. What his innovations are is a whole ton of techniques. Um, the way he uses harmonics, the way he um, uses the, um, the whammy bar, the tremolo arm. Um, the way he voices chords, the way he plays rhythm guitar, you know, the way he will get sounds out of the, 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 the strings, you know, behind the nut or, or at the other end, the way he uses his pickups or what, everything is created all these sounds. Um, so if you think of a tune like Cathedral, which is off Diver Down, you know, that's not about tapping. He is tapping, but he's tapping it with his left hand while he's operating the volume knob at the same time with an eighth note delay, which gives you this cascading sound. It's absolutely incredible. That is, it's the totality, not just the tapping. Guitarists had been tapping before Eddie Van Halen came along. I think Steve Hackett, <laughs> Steve Hackett, uh, on the, the, the giant hogweed on the nursery crime is, is tapping. I don't think Eddie Van Halen was even aware of this. You know, he went to tapping, uh, as he says, after watching um, Led Zeppelin and seeing that thing where, you know, Jimmy Page sort of, you know, plays the guitar with his hand up in the air. The notes seem to be coming out of nowhere. And he realised if you could do that hammer on and pull off thing with this hand, you could do it with this hand. I'm really getting into depth here and I don't want to. So, number one, guitar tab. All right now, guitar tab completely changes uh, rock music. Uh, I've taught music for years, and every kid that comes in playing guitar learns guitar through guitar tab. Now they might be learning a Guns N' Roses song, or they might be learning, you know, a REM song, but they are getting it through guitar tab, and that gave musicians a way of accessing music in a way that didn't exist before. Um, guitar tab is very easy to understand. You know, you can look at it and say, look, there's the string and there's the fret number, right? And you see that sign of it, that means it's a downstroke. Now, the guitar is a difficult instrument to read on because you have a choice of where the notes go. A lot of what Eddie Van Halen is doing, it's you have to play it in a specific position or it won't work. And so Guitar Tab was essential to be able to transcribe what Eddie Van Halen was doing. And this completely changes rock music as it affected every single guitarist after that that came up, right? This is the level of this guy's influence. Number two, right? He added a humbucking pickup to a Strat, right? A Fender Stratocaster was the sort of guitar that Jimi Hendrix played. Um, it's it's um, got the beautiful shape, 
the, you know, the classic, the classic body that we expect from a guitar. Um, and it's got a whammy bar, a treble on. Now I've gone and grabbed my Squire Strat. This is the Strat that you buy when you first start to play. This is the classic Squire Strat. Here it is. And there's, there's the whammy bar. There's my whammy bar on my Squire Strat. This is a relatively cheap guitar. Now this, you can put on the front of the encyclopedia of a guitar that everyone would recognize it. Now, the Strat had single coil pickups. These pickups um, were, so you got one um, rung of pickups and these pickups fed back. They were very noisy. Um, on a Gibson Les Paul, now Les Paul's a character that is almost like comparable to Eddie Van Halen. There's a wonderful story Eddie says that um, he, he knew Les Paul and they had to have all, they used to have all sorts of conversations. And one night Les Paul called up Eddie Van Halen and he said, there's only three people who really know how to make a guitar. Me, Leo Fender and Eddie Van Halen. It's incredible, right? Now the humbucker that you get on the uh, Les Paul gives you a much thicker sound. And if you're overdriving the guitar, there's a lot more oomph and it also books the hum. Now, if you, if you look at this here, you will see, right? that my guitar has two humbuckers. That is because of Eddie Van Halen. So Eddie Van Halen not only changed the way we transcribe guitarists to understand what all guitarists do now, but he also changed fundamentally the design of the guitar, right? These humbucking pickups on this type of guitar, there would have been no 80s metal without that, right? Um, another thing he did, and this is bizarre, <laughs> is that he used to pot his pickups. He invented this. Now, potting your pickup is where you take the pickup out, right, take the pickup out, and you get some paraffin wax, heat it up, and you drop the pickup in. And what that does is seal the pack pickup up. Now, the reason for this is because um, um, the old way they wired pickups, they could squeal, right? And Ed Eddie Van Halen had, um, uh, a theory that this is coming from the you know the, when you're playing at high volume that the the actual um, coil inside was shaking in some way. I wish I knew technically more, but that's roughly what it is. And he thought that if he dropped it into wax, he would be able to uh, seal that pickup. And it's now known as as potting the pickup. Right um, now, every single pickup that you buy on the whole, this has now become common practice, especially amongst anyone who's played overdriven rock guitar, right? So this is fundamental design change. Um, another thing he did technically was he used a, a Variac uh, transformer on his guitar. Now this is a device which lowers the voltage. You know. This happened because he, um, he, he he got himself his first Marshall, and on the back of the Marshall, there's a little switch which switches between um, UK voltage and um, American voltage. And so there was a lower amount of voltage going into the amp, and he found it had an incredible sound. So he, f he found this thing, which is a Variac um, transformer, and it goes between his guitar and his amp, and it means he could, he could change the amount of voltage going in and this gives him his incredible sound which has become known as the brown sound right so it's changed the design of the guitar it's changed the sound of the guitar and it's changed the way we understand guitar playing quite incredible um the um fifth i think we're at it the fifth of course is what i've mentioned before his groundbreaking techniques on guitar right so here are some of the things that Eddie Van Halen did, apart from tapping, that I think are absolutely incredible. He will often, this guitar's not plugged in, but he will often find harmonics on the guitar, especially around this region. Now, this guitar's not plugged in, but he would, he would hit a, a harmonic there and then bend it down. Or he would, he would uh, tremolo like this and then slide his hand up on the palm, picking up harmonics as he goes. These are the sort of techniques that he was doing. Um, what the effect this had is when people heard Eddie Van Halen for the first time, and I am that of that generation, 
nobody knew what he was doing. So if you take a tune like Mean Streets, he starts off um, sort of, he's tapping, but it's more like he's playing little block chords with his fingers in a very percussive style. And uh, what he's doing is very hard to do. There's a great video of Joe Satriani on the Howard Stern show. And the virtuoso Joe Satriani says, you know, play us Mean Streets. And he's struggling trying to play it because it's really, really hard. When I first heard that, I thought that was just sped up guitar. I thought he'd done some sped up. I just didn't know what it was. And what's really interesting about this is that Mean Streets, when the track comes in, that guitar intro that he plays never really happens again. Um, he would create little guitar vignettes that would go in front of the track, right? Stuff that an audience wouldn't normally listen to, almost coming from a sort of abstract, like classical influenced, you know, um, ethereal often approach to composition. These little things that have become signature pieces, you cannot play the tune without them, but actually they don't relate to the tune. Okay, there was all this musical information packed onto a Van Halen album, you know, so amongst all David Lee Roth's swagger and rock and roll sort of ebullience, within that you have these incredibly beautiful musical um, interludes or, or arrangement that's happening under the song. Um, when I was uh, got up this morning, I put on a um, fair warning to get into the mood for this. And it's just astonishing. It's all astonished. Everything that's going on is, oh, wow, he's doing this, he's doing that, you know. Um, and uh, someone had stuck some other rock band um, <laughs> in this thing. And then suddenly it was something like this comes on. It was like... And this guy's going... Standard rock band. And the difference between what Eddie Van Halen's doing, getting that feel, that chugging feel, but all this bonkers stuff, and you suddenly realize the level between your sort of average rock band and something that is at Van Halen level. It's absolutely astonishing. Um, this thing here, he made so much of this, the, you know, the whammy bar. Now this, this had often been used before this, it was sort of, Sorry, you know, that's some Hank Marvin. So you get a bit of vibrato. You know, it's very 1960s sound. That's all it was used for. And if you use this strap with this tremolo arm, right, that's no problem. But if you start diving, you know, all the stuff Hendrix was doing, if you do that, it knocks it out of tune. Now, with, um, with Jimi Hendrix, um, if you watch the Monterey pop, um, thing he comes out before he does wild thing go and check it out he comes out and he's going wow he's doing all this stuff and then when he finishes he checks the tuning of his guitar and it is like this one it's completely out of tune you can see jimmy goes oh my god i'm out of tune and then he just piles in eddie van halen wasn't going to do that he started to do all sorts of adaptions um to his tremolo arm now we have a thing called a floyd rose tremolo arm and the way that that is designed is this designed to go back into tune when you've thrown it around. It has locking nuts on the strings so the strings can't slip around and go out of tune. It has tuning, fine tuning on your right hand. So once you've locked the nuts off, you can still tune the guitar. There's a whole bunch of features on the Floyd Rose tremolo arm. That tremolo arm exists because of Eddie Van Halen, right? So I've now given you six huge reasons where Eddie Van Halen has changed um, the face of rock music. Now you could easily say, yes, but Andy, this is just like, these are just technical things, right? But these things were made by a company. These things were came out of Eddie Van Halen's musical vision. And so it's his musical vision for rock music that has changed the whole landscape of rock music. In that way, it shows that this band and this person is one of the most influential people in rock music. This will never get stated anywhere. You know, when you start to say the most important albums, the most influential, this and all that sort of thing, Van Halen won't come up. I did my 10 important albums and I think I'm guilty of that. You know, now I'm saying this, I thought, well, maybe I should have put Van Halen one in. You know, maybe that's the action. 
it's, it's, it's a strong argument that Van Halen 1 has influenced rock music more than, say, the Velvet Underground with Nico album, which I did put on the list. Right. Because even those sort of indie, jangly guitarists that came out in the 1980s and all those indie bands who were influenced by Velvet Underground, still, the guitars they were playing and the approach they had and all that stuff has, still has a little bit of Eddie Van Halen's DNA. Now, I've, I've got... Um, I've got, uh, we've just done six, so I've got four more to go. And these four are not so technical, just to show you how incredible this guy's influence is. Um, so, number seven, in 1978, Eddie Van Halen saved rock music. Now, rock music at the moment, it's on its arse. Nobody's interested. If you put the mainstream charts, there's no rock to be found. You know, Rick Beato gets really excited if he can find something in the top 20 that's got some guitar on, right? It might have been quantized and edited out of, you know, existence, right? But he gets excited. That's the situation we've got to. Rock music no longer has the power that it once had. Now, in 1976-77, he had that punk explosion, but much more important in the US, you had that new wave explosion, right? Bands like Blondie and Talking Heads. That's suddenly the cool thing. Now, they're still rock bands, but what about dirty rock and roll, okay? But the biggest thing at that time was disco. When disco came out, it was a threat to so many bands, right? It's disco that wipes out prog. It's disco that wipes out jazz fusion. And I've spoken to musicians at that time, Nora Michael Walden said this to me uh, when I interviewed him, that he, there he was making Jazz Fusions albums with the great Ray Gomez doing all his innovative and incredible guitar playing. And I have to do a video on Ray at some point. I'm waiting for him to call me up and uh, organise it, but um, that guy has not had his due. But I am now going on a sidetrack. So, um, Disco comes out and the record company suddenly turn around and go, you better write a hit record, we're going to kick you off the label. Right, such was the landscape in 1977-78. When Van Halen comes out, Van Halen won, the album comes out and it goes on to sell 10 million copies and become one of the biggest selling albums in the US of all time. You know, um, I, I, I'm not off the top of my head quite aware of the actual sales for Van Halen. I think they've sold about 50, 60, 70 million. I'm, I don't know. But I know that 1984 sold 10 million and uh, Van Halen 1 sold 10 million. That's 20 million just with those two albums. That, that completely changes the landscape. So when that album comes out, the record labels are still looking to sign these bands. Thank God. What would have happened if that hadn't have happened at that point? Now, at that time... We were seeing the rise of MTV. So MTV is coming out. And MTV is still sort of rock band focused, right? Um, but then suddenly Michael Jackson hits. Michael Jackson comes out and he now takes over. And you see a shift in popular music away from rock bands writing pop records to sort of much more dance soul and then rap's going to come in hip hop and we're slowly moving into you know, music made by machines. Now I absolutely love Michael Jackson and Michael Jackson um, faced a problem in 1981. He had become the biggest black artist in the world but a black artist could not transition you know, to become a mainstream artist. It's very hard to think of any artist in the 1970s that's a mainstream artist, like a Led Zeppelin level or a David Bowie level. There's not many. Once you get to the 1980s, you've got Prince, you've got Whitney Houston, you know, you've got um, Michael Jackson. There's a whole bunch of black artists. Now, Michael Jackson opens the door for this. And the reason is it becomes, he becomes aware that um, to get played on MTV he is going to have to bring in a rock sound. And that is on Thriller, just to a certain extent, but especially on the track Beat It. So if you're going to make a rock track, who do you go for? You go for Eddie Van Halen. So he calls up Eddie. Eddie agrees to do it. How much do you want? I don't want anything. I'll just come in and do it. Now, Eddie Van Halen, when they first signed in 1978, the band that opened up for them at one point um, on their first tour 
was the progressive rock band UK, which featured John Wetton, um, Eddie Jobson, um, Bill Bruford and Alan Holdsworth. Now, Alan Holdsworth is perhaps the most innovative, um, creative guitarist that's ever lived, <laughs> I would say. But Alan Holdsworth's music is very, very esoteric. But Eddie loves him. It, Alan Holdsworth affected all the guitar players at that time. I think a lot of the stuff you hear after the first album, which is on the, I, I was listening to Fair Warning, and there's certain runs, which is sort of a rock and roll approximation of what Alan Holdsworth is doing on guitar. And I think he, you know, I think Van Halen utilizes tapping then to try and get this sort of cascading, you know, sort of, You know that sort. Of, he would he would try and get that Holdsworth sound by using his tapping. Holdsworth, of course, was doing it with one hand, four notes per string. <laughs> well, Eddie Van Halen is playing three notes per string and tapping where that top one is, right? Um, Eddie Van Halen championed Alan Holdsworth, and he he really wanted to push him to the fore. He got him a major label deal with Warner Brothers, and he was going to pr produce what became Road Games. It was an unmitigated disaster. Alan Holdsworth was not going to be budged. He was not going to change anything, you know, that would affect his creative vision. But the point here that's interesting is Alan Holdsworth's tone was absolutely incredible. Alan Holdsworth was like Eddie Van Halen, a technical innovator. He was in, in inside his hamps. He was looking at the wiring of his pickups to get this beautiful silky sound. When Eddie Van Halen went in to record the guitar solo for Beat It. He was acquainted then with Alan Holdsworth and he went and borrowed Alan Holdsworth's amp. Alan Holdsworth and Eddie Van Halen, those two guitar players, are key for the development of guitar playing in the 1980s. And it never gets said. And that guitar solo, right, that's on Beat It, um, I think is so important to maintaining the position that Van Halen had done in 1978 of, 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 of keeping rock bands in the spotlight and your Bon Jovi's and then you, you know, the return of Kiss, the return of Aerosmith is all possible. But this comes from Van Halen. They're influencing thrash metal. They're in, influencing the new wave of British heavy metal. They're in, influencing jazz rock, jazz fusion, prog metal. And they're even influencing hair metal. This is the most important rock band of the last 40 years, right? Um, there was always a dynamic going on of the sort of populist showman of Dave Lee Roth and Eddie Van Halen's sort of musical vision, okay? Um, when they first came out, um, on the first album, the uh, third track on that, was it the second track? I think it's the third track. So it opens up with Running With The Devil, then we have Eruption, which is like the, the, <laughs> the, the I mean, who, how many debut rock albums can you think of where the band comes out and then the second track is just a solo guitar piece, right? And you'd think everyone would go, oh, just flick past this and we wouldn't be talking about it. Eruption changed a generation and then that goes into You Really Got Me. And You Really Got Me was a big hit. They play it beautifully and it points right back to the beginnings of heavy, heavy rock with the kinks. The lineage is there. Um, that was a big success and you see on so many Van Halen albums, um, there are cover versions, you know, Pretty Woman and all this type of stuff, right? A Van Halen take on it. This was very popular. They were always released as a singles. The record company wanted it and Dave Lee Roth wanted it. As the band went on, Dave Lee Roth got his say and on Diver Down, it is covered in cover versions and weird comedy tracks. Now, I really like Diver Down, and I will talk about it in a bit, but it's often seen as their weakest album. The lack of a success meant that Eddie Van Halen was then allowed to step forward with, his, with the 1984 album. So he's going to come out with his musical genius. The record companies allowed him to do it, right? There he is, but does the album... The single comes out, Jump. Jump is without a doubt Eddie Van, ha uh, it's Van Halen's sort of most recognisable single. It was a thing I heard when the album came out that, that got me into Van Halen, um, although it's a strange story how I got into Van Halen. But um, I'll talk about it when we get to the album. But the thing that's really important with Jump is here we have Van Halen 
the most iconic track by them and the riff is Eddie on keyboards. This is a mark of his genius. At that point, when he's given creative freedom, and he's going, right, I'm going to show you. Eddie Van Halen comes out with a video where he's sat there playing the keyboards and it rocks and nobody notices it. It's not about the guitar with Eddie. It's about his musical vision. Right? Um, so, the promotion of Alan Holdsworth, I didn't say that was one of the points. Um, the... the uh, utilization of the keyboards in rock music to create these riffs and the um, influence on MTV. If I should have said they were, I didn't number them, you see, but that's, I've, I've now run through it. So that's the first part of this video. That's the first 20 minutes there where I've gone through 10 innovations that change the face of rock music, which come directly from Eddie Van Halen. I'm now going to rank the Van Halen albums and in my notes here I have actually put the amount and number of albums they sold 80 million albums we're talking here now I am going to rank now the uh, Van Halen albums that have Dave Lee Roth on them and I'll tell you why because for me Van Halen is Dave Lee Roth <laughs> that's, that's the way it is when Dave Lee Roth left I didn't follow Van Halen, I followed Dave Lee Roth. And, and it, what's bizarre is he then goes on to um, do that sort of crazy from the Heat EP with California Girls. He, he, he gets out every fibre of his cover band, you know, vaudeville thing, and his brilliant EP. Then he forms a band with Steve Vai, and he takes the Van Halen thing and moves it forward. The addition of Sammy Hagar coincides with the groundwork that Van Halen have laid and suddenly you have this keyboard driven rock music which is you know um, hitting the charts and they have another huge hit record you know with Why Can't This Be Love um, I rushed and got 5150 when it came out and I just thought it was okay I was a little bit let down uh, Sammy Hagar was almost like too good a singer too strong a songwriter and, and a good guitar player. It's got to be said that the one of the few influences that we can point at is uh, is Ronnie Montrose's album, the first album, Mon Montrose. You know, you know, Space Station Number Nine. That's definitely uh, you know um, laying the groundwork for what Van Halen are going to do. But anyway, I digress. There's nothing wrong with it. They're great albums for me. I think of that as like many people, Van Hagar. So I'm not going to rank those albums. I got 5150. I thought it was okay. OU812 came out. I liked that more. But by that time, I stopped. And I don't know the albums after that. I know there's some really good stuff there. Um, if I think for unlawful cold knowledge, I've listened. So there's some good stuff. That is, I'm not sidetracking because I hate it. But for me, I want to rank the Dave Lee Roth albums because for me, that's where Van Halen resides. So... At number um, seven, so there's seven albums we're going to look at. At number seven, we have the final Van Halen album, A Different Kind of Truth. This is when they finally got Dave Lee Roth back in the band. And it's a very, very good album. If you consider the, the sort of acrimonious split and all the fighting and all the stuff that's gone on and then they get back together then they split up and at that, this point they obviously couldn't work together but they managed to stand each other enough to get in the studio and make this album <clears throat> it's a great album right I just think that it lacks the zeitgeist you know on those early albums Van Halen is riding a wave Right, that's gone. Everyone went to listen to this album to see, oh, does it sound good? Does it sound like Van Halen? It's it is the trouble when bands get older. You're no longer, you know, getting them for the innovation. You're getting them to have the secure feeling that they still sound like they all should have always sounded. I mean, Extreme did this brilliant with that Rise album. Absolutely brilliant. And in many ways, it's unlike any of the early Extreme albums, but it delivered what we wanted, you know. And this album does too. It's a very good album. Right, can't say much more about it, but that's what I have at number seven. At number six, I have the aforementioned Diver Down. Now, Diver Down is a very short album. It's about half an hour long. It's got all sorts of um, 
different tracks on there. Um, we get a version of Pretty Woman on there. Um, we get, um, what's the other cover version on that album? Can't remember. <laughs> um, it, it opens up the album. Anyway, ton of cover versions, a ton of comedy songs. Um, Van Halen really hit their stride with that sort of that swingy beat that they uh, they were like sort of pioneers of, which they got from Billy Cobb and Spectrum on the Full Bug, and the Full Bug is one of my favourite Van Halen songs. But within this, tracks like Little Guitars, Cathedral this genius what Van Halen's doing and the fact it jumps so, so around so much and it's so eclectic we, with my prog ears I love it you know and and Big Bad Bill which features their dad on clarinet it's a wonderful thing you know um, Happy Trails that was the one there's that acapella Happy Trails I'm sure there's another cover version on there um, fantastic album not representatives of Van Halen not quite focused in its in it, what it wants to do. Um, some of the albums we're going to talk about are fantastic, but it is a lot of the sort of Van Halen sound. This is eclectic. It's interesting, and there's certain moments. Um, the 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 intro to Little Guitars, where um, Eddie Van Halen plays a pedal and then he plays these chords that move up. It's so beautiful. It's so musical. No other rock guitarist would even be able to attempt something like that. It's absolutely incredible. Right. Um, at number five, I have Women and Children First, right? Women and Children First is a really great, solid Van Halen album. If you wanted to have a Van Halen album that represented them, all the ones we're talking about, do that, okay? But I think this crisis that emerges a little bit it's only a tiny little thing which just notches it down this crisis emerges this, uh, between the sort of popularity and the um van halen thing right with women and children first which is um i think it's the third album um it's there's just it, it just doesn't have that real classic moment on that album for me you know, there is no jump, there is no hop for teacher, there is no, you know, running with the devil or ain't talking about love. But it's a fantastic album, you know, some incredible playing on there. And some real innovative stuff on keyboards, which sort of um, is a precursor of what, we, what we're going to see on 1984. At number four, I have Van Halen 2. Now, the Van Halen, that first album sold 10 million copies, um... It's a hard thing to follow up. Um, I think they do it absolutely brilliantly. Um, I don't feel the production on the second album is quite like the first. The first album's got a magical sound to it. It's one of the greatest produced rock albums of all time. Um, but in there, there's some incredible stuff. And um, Spanish Fly, when I, when I had that album, there was loads of great stuff on it. But Spanish Fly, right, was the one which is a basically another solo guitar piece, but on classical guitar. And I think that was a, a, a sort of riposte to everyone was saying, oh yeah, well, he's just playing electric guitar. No one understands how hard it is to control electric distorted guitar at high volume with feedback. And they don't understand what Eddie Van Halen's doing. You know, I think most people, most guitarists, if they picked up Eddie Van Halen's guitar, you know, in a stadium and tried to play it, would realize what this guy was doing. But anyway, with that, he creates this, this sort of Spanish guitar piece. It's absolutely beautiful. The guitar playing is still innovative. Um, they they take the first album and they do run with it. You know, um, it didn't sell as well. It was a little bit of a stumble for them. It's a great album. Now, the last three are absolute rock masterpieces. At number three, I have Fair Warning, which is an incredible album. There is a part of me that's could easily say this is the greatest of them, right? That it shows the the brilliance of the first album and the brilliance of 1984, that it's right in the middle, right? It's heavy, right? And it's in your face. It sounds incredible, right? It's absolutely incredible from the moment it opens up with Mean Streets, that funny guitar thing, Sinner's Swing, and Unchained. Unchained is one of my favourite Van Halen songs. It just rocks we have all sorts of stuff going on in this album, but it's just so dirty 
and in your face. I think it came out in 1981, was it? Incredible, 1981. Incredible album. You know, right in the middle of that new wave of British heavy metal when all the British bands like I Made and Diamond Head, they're there. And this was another album. It had that accelerated, um, you know, almost like punkish sound, but with that virtuosity. For me, this album is part of that new wave of British heavy metal, even though it's not British, I would say. It was so important at that time. An incredible album. Um, many people would have it at number two and if it would be your number two or even your number one you are perfectly justified in that position right but for me and this is personal at number two I have 1984 now all right what can I say about this Panama you know um, Jump um, House of Pain Hot for Teacher Every track on here is like an absolute masterpiece. It's they're at their best. The production's incredible, and the, you know, eighties rock. Eighties rock's awful, isn't it? Until the grunge guys come along, it's just like hair metal all over the place, isn't it? But with um, nineteen eighty four, it's that keyboard-driven rock that Bon Jovi are going to do so successfully later on. But it's absolutely sublime. Um, so. Um, someone gave me a tape full of songs. I think it was taped off the Friday Rock Show uh, around about 1982. And there was a track on there and it was labelled as Blue Oyster Cult. And the track was Ice Cream Man off the first album. That was the first song I ever heard by Van Halen. And when I heard it, my jaw hit the floor. And I thought it was Blue Oyster Cult, which then got me to go and buy two Blue Oyster Cult albums, Agents of Fortune and Secret Treaties. Now, these are great albums, without a doubt. But for me, I was expecting Van Halen. It gave me a lifelong hatred of Blue Oyster Cult, even though Godzilla is one of the greatest rock tracks of all time. And I know it, right? That was on Axe Attack 2, and I love that, right? But I was searching for this guitar playing and this band, and where was it? And going through Blue Oyster Cult, right? So that was the first time I heard him, right? Then, um, 1984 comes out, I'm watching Top of the Pops, and uh, the jump video comes out, and I literally jumped out of my seat when I heard that track, and when it went to his guitar solo, I was like, what is this? I went to school the next day very excited about all this, and I say to my friends, did you see Jump on Top of the Pops? And I'm going, well, by the Pointer Sisters, right? And I went, no, not that one, there's another Jump. And they went, oh my God, I saw that, it was terrible. All my friends in their mullets listening to awful Duran Duran and all these other bands that I love now, but back then I hated them, they thought it was absolutely awful, right? Here in the UK, we did not get that American rock thing, but I did, and I went out and bought, despite the fact I was going against my um, friend group, I went out and bought 1984, took it home, and that was the album for me, right? It always has been. I could easily put it at number one. If I had to have one album that to keep by Van Halen, it would be 1984. But of course, at number one, I have Van Halen one. I've explained why it's groundbreaking. It's incredibly, it's credibly recorded. It changes the face of rock music. All the way through it, that is guitar, bass, and drums and vocal. There's one guitar panned over the one side with a reverb over the other. I think that's how they've done it. Bass down the middle, that sort of barky drum sound, you know, funky drum sound of Alex Van Halen. It's a game changer, right? So I've done a ranking. I've talked about Eddie Van Halen. I think I've said as much as I wanted to do. So I am now going to stop now. And I am going to say my ending speech, I always say, which is if you like this video, you know, like it. Don't not like it because it really helps the channel. And since I've been saying press the like button, I felt my channel's going up. So if you want to help me out, press that like button. It's not going to work. You just press it. Thank you very much. Right. If you want to see more, you could subscribe, ring the notification bells, and you know. I have a Patreon with has, which has tons of content on there, but it also... We interact and we have a meeting every couple of weeks, you know, on Zoom. And we, they, oh, it's just brilliant. It's like a little party. I've met up with many of the patrons. It's a, it's a thing. It's that my patron is a thing. But if you're a busy person and do not wait, want to waste your time in Andy Land, you could put, if you could please, and it's really helped me out at the, month, at the moment as I try and get this channel off the ground, if you could please put a little 
donation into my YouTube PayPal tip jar. Many of you are. I'm getting two quid here, three quid there, every man there, 10 pounds. Absolutely fantastic. We're going somewhere with this channel. This time next year, we'll be millionaires. Which is a line from Only Fools and Horses, a great British TV series. Thank you for watching. I will see you on the next one. Bye.